I'm going to finish this morning a short series of lessons on understanding our God. Uh, the one that we have sung to today, or the one that we sing to, I should say, uh, and we'll continue to praise the rest of our days. The one who influences our life in all ways that are important, the one to whom we uh, give our allegiance, and the one to whom before we will bow and one day live in eternity with. It's important that we understand Him, because our life is changed as we understand and know Him. But our God is unique among anything or anyone we know. Our God, as we sing, is in three persons. There is one God in Scripture, uh, but God is in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk this morning about the Holy Spirit and understand this person that makes up this one God that we have that also consists of the Father and the Son. We're going to talk about His existence today and also His presence. Uh, again, remember, we, our God consists of three personal beings. All three equally God we find uh, in the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1. Um, that there are multiple persons that make up God. They speak with each other about creation and making uh, mankind in their image. Uh, we find that all three work together. They were present at the baptism of Jesus, Matthew 3.16. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 30, uh, we find all three have a role in our lives. It's all for the good. God the Father, Father God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But we struggle to understand that we have one God, how are there three persons? Well, it hit me this morning. I don't know why it took so long. Actually, I forgot to include this in a slide. But um, you think about our government. Uh, if you remember your civics class long, long ago, uh, you'll remember that our, our government's made up of three parts. You have the legislative branch, or Congress, that makes the laws. You have the executive branch, uh, where the president and his cabinet are. And then you have the third branch, the test here. Jude, oh man. Is that you, Kenneth? Oh. Brother Wilson, good, you got it. Yes, the judicial branch where the Supreme Court is and all the other different branches of the court. They all three work together, but they're all three government. When the Supreme Court makes a decision, that's a government-making decision. When the president makes an executive decision, that's a government-making decision. When Congress passes a law, that's a government. Three distinct entities that are very separate from each other, but they're all three government. That is a rough illustration, but that's one of the best I've found uh, to simply illustrate the nature of our God. Well, this morning, the Holy Spirit, the first part, His existence, His empowerment, and His influence. First of all, just the words Holy Spirit. What do those words mean? Uh, the word holy in Scripture means to be set apart or distinct. Uh, we sing holy, holy, holy. Uh, in fact, the Spirit is honored within that song, but the word holy simply means separate, distinct, above all things. Uh, even we as Christians are called to be holy. Peter teaches in 1 Peter chapter 1. God says, be holy for I am holy. We're to have set apart lives for God, but God himself is holy and is not to be equated with some created being or some common entity. The word spirit, uh, the word spirit to break it down simply, it doesn't have a body. A spirit is a being, but yet without some physical form that you can see or touch. And this is a description of the third person of what at times is called the Trinity in just religious language, but in some versions of the Godhead, this triune God that we have. This third person is called the holy or distinct spirit that is this entity that simply doesn't possess a body as we would understand it. But this word spirit is confusing. I thought about the word spirit as I was preparing this week. We have all kinds of things that are called spirit. Um, an old word for alcohol is spirits. Oh, there's the spirits up there on the shelf. Um, the spirit has been the name of a car. The car did not last long in popularity, but was called the spirit. Um, there's a movie my children liked about a horse called Spirit. Um, the word spirit's used to describe sometimes simply enthusiasm or energy. It's very important for our activities director at San Mateo High School to make sure the school has spirit. 
fact, I remember uh, when I was in junior high myself, the cheerleading team would talk about, they would shout back at the opposing team, uh, we have spirit, how about you? And uh, sometimes the word spirit gets used in different ways. Sometimes the word spirit simply means enthusiasm, energy, or we might say, well, boy, they have a lot of spirit. They might be uh, energetic in their talk. But the word spirit in its fundamental sense, in the way that the Bible uses it for the third person of the Godhead, is simply a being that doesn't have a body. And that is not like us, but yet it is very real. And its presence is definitely out there, but just don't go looking for something. He will never be under the chair. He will never uh, be in any physical form that you might find, but he definitely is there. And our challenge is to understand something that is somewhat difficult for us to understand. Let's look at some introduction text. Look at John chapter 7. Look at John 7, then we'll look at Ephesians 5. Um, the Holy Spirit of God is all over Scripture, working, engaged in different ways, but it's just a challenge to understand his work. But I think we can break it down to some fundamental things. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. Look what Jesus himself said about the Spirit of God. Uh, John 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water water will flow from within them. Verse 39, notice John's commentary. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So here Jesus talks about how that one who puts their faith in him, livers, or, I'm sorry, rivers of living water will flow from them. That's a powerful and beautiful and positive image. Well, what's he talking about? Well, John goes, John goes on to say uh, in verse 39, By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believe, that's you and I, were later to receive. So here, even before the Spirit of God came into believers, Jesus is previewing what would happen. The Spirit of God would come into people as a blessing from God. So that means you and I are going to be affected personally by the Holy Spirit. And that's a good thing, the Spirit coming into our lives. Look now at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, probably a more familiar text. Ephesians 5 verse 15, Paul writes to the Ephesian believers, Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with, not spirit, or these, or not with spirits, but the spirit. Be filled with the spirit, sing and make music uh, from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here Paul teaches, instead of being consumed by alcohol, he says, instead be filled with the Spirit, not with spirits or just spirit, like be enthusiastic, but be filled with the Spirit, and then he gives the way, it's through singing. And one way the Spirit works is when we take in the words of these songs. We allow them to permeate our emotions and then it affects our decisions when we leave this place. God's Spirit is working inside your life. So the Spirit of God is not just some mystery entity that's out there somewhere. He resides within you, and He influences by your cooperation what you do in a very positive way. And that's what we're going to look at uh, these next few lessons. Well, first of all, we have to come to terms with this truth. The Holy Spirit exists as God not a ghost. We have to do some blasting sometimes before we do some building in our understanding. In the older English version of our Bibles, the King James Version, which is a good translation, it's just somewhat older now, Holy Spirit is translated what? Holy Ghost, which at the time was fine. Um, but at this time, <laughs> Holy Ghost 
the idea of a ghost just conveys more negative and Hollywood type images where it's more misleading. The word pneuma in the Greek can be translated simply spirit. And even though that might be somewhat vague to us, it doesn't have all the negative baggage as the word ghost because of our modern creations. What's interesting, though, is in the New Testament, people apparently believed in ghosts. Uh, Jesus acknowledged not that ghosts existed, but he claimed that uh, his body was real as it was resurrected. And he says, if I didn't have this body, uh, uh, maybe it would be a ghost or something like that. Uh, but don't think of the Holy Ghost as some kind of spooky figure floating down the hallways or hiding behind the furniture or something like that. Holy Spirit is the best way today in modern language to convey the nature of God. But He is a spirit. We find that clear in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. By the way, I have a lot of scripture up here today that uh, you can take a picture of or you can just write down. We won't be able to reference all of it, but I'm going to try to hit the key ones. But scripture emphasizes over and over again that the Holy Spirit is spirit, but yet the Holy Spirit is also God, but He's not a ghost. He's not some mystery figure. He's present at creation. Uh, notice how quickly the Spirit of God appears on the scene. Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So even before our earth was fully formed, the Spirit of God was there. The Spirit of God is not a created being. It's not some entity that showed up later after the Father and the Son. It's not a lesser being in any way. The Holy Spirit in Scripture is presented clearly as God and was there right at the beginning, hovering over the waters as the land was being formed. Um, when God speaks, it says, Then God said, Let us make human Beings in our image, this is verse 26, in our likeness. So when God speaks within himself, that's engaging the Son who's speaking back. Let us make God in our image. And also the Spirit of God is being engaged as well. So the Spirit of God has always existed as the Father and also as the Son has. A third, the Holy Spirit possesses all the qualities of God. Look at Psalm 139. Notice how personal these qualities are. Uh, go back to uh, your Older Testaments, uh, Psalm uh, 139. Look at the prophet David's understanding of the Spirit of God. Psalm 139. And I'm spending a little time with this because there are some religious groups that believe the Holy Spirit is not God. They believe that there's only God the Father, and they deny that Jesus is God, and they also deny the Holy Spirit is God. Because they're making distinctions that Scripture doesn't make. But what we see here is the Spirit of God is possessing all the qualities of the Son and of the Father. So it is right to worship the Spirit of God in song. It's right to believe as strongly in the Spirit of God as we do God the Father and the Son. Look at David's sense of God's Spirit. Psalm 139. You have searched me, O God, verse 1, and know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Just pause here. That's omniscience. The Spirit of God is all-knowing, just like the Father is all-knowing and the Son of God is all-knowing. Verse 3, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Just pause here. The Spirit of God knows everything about you. He knows your comings and goings. There's nothing that escapes His knowledge. Verse 4, before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Verse 7 now, this is our key verse. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Let's pause here. Here he's talking about the Spirit of God is always present or omnipresent. 
Just like the Spirit of God knows all things, He's always present. There's no place where you can hide that He is not there. Same is true of the Father and the Son. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. Here God is being described in this powerful sense of presence in David's life, and the Spirit of God's included. There's nothing the Spirit of God doesn't know about, just like there's nothing the Father does not know about, nor the Son. So when you read about the Spirit of God in Scripture, or when you sing about the Spirit of God, or when you understand prayers we're going to discuss in just a moment, understand the Spirit of God as powerful as the Father and the Son just has a different role. God works in different ways in your life, the Father has an emphasis, the Son does, and so does the Spirit. Also in Acts chapter 5, this is very interesting and kind of a dark scene, but in Acts chapter 5, remember when Ananias and Sapphira tried lying about their contribution? Uh, everyone was to give just how their heart motivated them to give, but Ananias and Sapphira decided to do an accounting gimmick and say they'd given a whole bunch more than they actually gave, and Peter as an apostle, confronted them. But notice what he accused them of doing. Verse 5, book of Acts. We fast forward now to uh, the early days of Christianity from Psalm 139, the Old Testament. Luke writes in Acts 5.1, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Verse 3 now. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. So Peter first says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. What motivates you to do that? And then secondly, he follows up by saying, you haven't lied just to human beings, that is, your fellow church members. You've lied also to God. So he's equating the Holy Spirit with God. That was the common Christian understanding, that the Holy Spirit himself was also God, just as the Father is God and the Spirit is God. So understand the Holy Spirit is God, but also understand He's not a ghost. He's not some simplistic figure floating around in a bedsheet or in fog or smoke or anything like that. You will never see Him. But His presence is all over the place, and we'll talk more about that. Number two, the Holy Spirit works powerfully, but behind the scenes. The Holy Spirit works powerfully, but behind the scenes. I found this interesting as I was uh, studying on this lesson, just in the most prominent places of the Holy Spirit, you find Him simply being present. Uh, we looked earlier at Genesis 1-2, He was hovering over the water before the land formations were made. Even before the Father or the Son is mentioned, the Spirit is described as hovering over the waters in verse 2. Uh, Matthew 3.16, which we looked at a few weeks ago, uh, when Jesus was baptized, remember there's a voice from heaven, the Father, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So the Son is being baptized, the Father speaks from heaven, but then how does the Spirit appear? Think back to the picture you saw in the previous slide. As a dove, the Spirit comes down as a dove upon the Son. So, you find the Spirit being present. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, this is a well-known uh, chapter. Uh, remember when the Spirit of God uh, came down upon the apostles and they all could speak in other languages? Let me read this scene. Notice how the Spirit appears. Chapter 2, verse 1 of Acts. 
When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. First of all, this sound comes like a wind, a violent wind. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Then verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit as they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I thought, well, this is interesting. When you, in these most prominent places where the Holy Spirit is working, you, you have this presence, but you don't have a person that walks through the door. But he hovers over the waters, creation. He comes down as a dove in this spirit sense of the word at Jesus' baptism. And then he comes down in this wind and in the word uh, pneuma in Greek is translated spirit. If you know mechanics and stuff, pneumatic air gun, pneuma, when air is forced through a piece of a tool or something like that, pneumatic. Um, the idea here, this wind comes into the room, but then these tongues of fire appear above the apostles who then are enabled to speak in languages that they don't already know. That seems to be the consistent model of the Spirit's presence in the Bible. Never a person, never a thing, but always a presence that appears in different ways or affects people in different ways. So the biggest thing to think about the Spirit of God as you try to understand something that's a little difficult to understand is think of presence. Think of God's presence being here, but again, don't go look for something. Even if someone's really ecstatic and they're excited about Jesus, doesn't necessarily mean the Spirit of God's with them. They may just be excited. They may just have a charismatic personality. You have to look at a biblically defined presence, but there clearly is a biblically defined presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, someone might ask, well, what does the Holy Spirit do? He does a lot, but the thing that seems to be the most common thing he does can be captured in the one word, empowers. He empowers God's people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, or he empowers them to do things they need a lot of help doing. And he does both of those at different times, and he's worked in different ways all throughout Scripture. But don't expect him today be, to be doing the same thing he did 2,000 years ago. God's purpose is always working itself out in different ways. I was thinking just with modern firefighting equipment. Uh, I was looking at um, some pictures from a museum of uh, firefighting equipment uh, from back in the early 1900s. I'm not sure if any of that equipment could put out a fire. It was just a tank of water and a hose, and I think... We all know it's too late to really do anything. Um, but look at firefighting equipment today. There are ladders and high-tech hoses and water distribution systems, things like that. You can actually put out a fire uh, and save something. But still, water is working, but it's working different ways. We're not using old equipment and putting out fires. And, and same with computer technology and things like that. So we should not be expecting the Holy Spirit to do the same thing he's doing 2,000 years ago. Things have changed, but there are some things that have not changed. Let me just grasp some of these. Here in Acts 2, you find the Holy Spirit of God being sent down upon the apostles. And it says here in verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, that means other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Now, some people think, well, man, that's what the Holy Spirit does. He enables people to speak in other languages, and we should be seeing that today. Maybe. <laughs> uh, just because something's in the Bible, though, doesn't mean it's happening today, 2,000 years later. The time when the Holy Spirit was working here was a time in which there was no written Bible like we have today. And the credibility of God's words was dependent upon the speaker being credible. How could someone really know God was speaking through somebody? Even today, if someone 
at the bus stop says, hey, I'm speaking for God, you're going to say, oh, yeah? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, you're going to want some proof, some evidence. And people in the first century the same way. So God would speak miraculously through his spirit. And here with his 12 apostles, he enabled them to speak in languages that the people that were listening knew they couldn't speak. And remember, Peter gets up to speak and the other apostles, and they all spoke in languages. And the people that are from all over the world say, hey, how can we hear these men who are from one area all in our own language? And they listened to what Peter and the other apostles were saying. In the early years of Christianity, God worked miraculously through the Holy Spirit in all kinds of situations. Some people would receive a direct revelation from God and would perform a miracle to confirm that that revelation was truly from God. There were gifts of healing that were empowered by the Holy Spirit where someone could heal someone's sickness, but it was all designed to prove the credibility of the person before there was any source that was considered credible. The oral teaching of the Word of God was extremely important, but you couldn't have just a bunch of charlatans out there claiming they were speaking from God, because there were those kind of people. But the Holy Spirit and early Christians could demonstrate through spiritual gifts. Not only they were spokespersons of God, but they were legitimate forms of help and assistance. And all these verses confirm that. But one key role, and we're going to look at one text. Look at 2 Peter, the last verse on the end. One key role that the Spirit of God had was working through those speakers to provide the credible words that we have today in what's called our Bible. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Look what the Apostle Peter says about how the Holy Spirit worked in what we have today as the teachings of God. Verse 19, 2 Peter 1. Peter says, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Verse 20 now. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as what? They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's primary work is in the formation of the Word of God. By using, using human beings, and there are over 40 separate authors of the Old Testament and the New Testament together, working through them where God would speak through His Spirit to the human beings, and they would write down what God was saying. But the Spirit was used as that mediator or the one that would form those words within the apostles. They weren't just like going into some trance and just writing down things methodically. But God was using their personality. That's why you see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all written in different styles. But yet, still, the Spirit of God was guiding them to make sure God's words were being communicated. And that is one of the primary roles of the Holy Spirit, to make sure that we have accurately communicated words of God with us today. And we have different English translations trying to capture the original, but the Holy Spirit guided to make sure we had accurately the words of the God. So He empowered people to write down God's communication to His creation. The Spirit of God that's always present. But that work of empowering the apostles to write or other Bible writers was done behind the scenes. You don't find there being any booth where the apostles went into that, okay, we're going to get something from the Holy Spirit now. You didn't find them changing colors. You didn't find anything that you could see as tangible other than maybe those tongues of fire that appeared above the apostles in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit is always working behind the scenes, but clearly working through His presence to communicate God's will or to strengthen God's people. So again, don't look for something with the Holy Spirit. Look at Scripture and what it says God is doing. And therein you'll find the strength. One final thing, and then we'll be through this morning. The Holy Spirit influences personally, but quietly. 
Again, we're just going to pick out some of these. But again, our challenge today is we want to feel something from God. Uh, we want to be enthusiastic. We want to be charismatic in the general sense of that word about what we believe. And a lot of people, they'll want to attribute a sense of enthusiasm to the Holy Spirit's presence. Now, at times in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit he, uh, would work by the sound of that mighty rushing wind coming into the room in Acts 2, and those tongues of fire appearing above the head of the apostles. But that didn't happen any other time. That was a very unique time at the very beginning of Christianity. And remember, the Holy Spirit has worked in different ways at different times for just the purpose of God that was needed at the moment. And some of those purposes have gone away. In particular, spiritual gifts and someone being able to do miracles or even raise someone from the dead or, or speak in other languages or receive a revelation from God. We have everything we now have uh, now uh, in written scripture, everything God wants us to have. So a lot of those things went away, just like old firefighting equipment went away when it was deemed no longer necessary. But certain things have stayed and those certain things are very powerful today. First of all, concerning what the Spirit of God does today that you can count on and that's beautiful and that will move your life is, first of all, the Spirit of God affirms the presence of God in your life. Look at Acts 2.38, probably the most well-known verse. We're in Acts already. Look what Peter says will come upon those who put their faith and trust in God and obey Him. Verse 38, Acts 2, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So here when someone is baptized into Christ, they find the forgiveness of their sins. God's Spirit comes into their life. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? This is one of the amazing blessings of God. When someone is baptized into Christ, the Spirit of God takes up residency in their life. Some people say, well, the Word of God's just in the written Word. It's not at all. Or God's Spirit is just in the written Word. Not at all. God's Spirit works powerfully through the written Word, but God's Spirit also lives within you. That's why you're called a temple of the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 139, remember David said, do not take your spirit away from me. Actually, that's Psalm 51, where David says, do not take your spirit away from me. In fact, when Nathaniel leads a song, create in me a clean heart, we sing the very words from David's psalm of repentance after sin with Bathsheba. David's fearful of God's spirit being taken away from him because he doesn't want God's presence taken away. But when Scripture says the Spirit of God lives within you, that's confirmation that you're within the favor of God. When He lives within you, you could not be any closer to God except for the day that He calls you home to be with Him face to face. But within all believers, as they faithfully live for God, God's Spirit lives within them. So His presence affirms God is with you. You might say, well, how do I know that? You know it by faith. You know it just like you know you're forgiven of your sins when you're baptized. You're not going to see anything. You're not going to feel something move through your body that confirms God's presence. You believe by faith. And that's why John said, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. When you believe, though, you don't see things. You simply believe God said it is the case that a spirit lives within you. God says, that's exactly what I want. Second, he assures your future uh, salvation. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul writes, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. 
Here we find that not only the Spirit of God confirms God's presence in our life, the Spirit of God in our life confirms that one day we will be with Him forever. The Spirit's presence, Paul says, is a guarantee of the great things of God to come. That one day you're going to be together with God in eternity. But you might say, well, I sure wish I had something to grab onto, though. I sure wish I had something visible or audible I could experience in my life to believe that God is there. Well, maybe that would help. There's all kinds of people in the Bible that saw all kinds of miracles, but yet they still walked away from God. Don't think that having something tangible in your pocket, that go, oh, okay, God's with me, is going to make you a different person. The Bible is full of people that had, it had no effect. You believe by faith that the Spirit's within you guaranteeing what's to come and also guaranteeing your approval before God as you live for Him. The Holy Spirit even assists with your prayers. We're going to look at more of this next week, but I just want to give a quick preview before we're done. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. If you say, well, I, I need something I can grab onto. Here's something to grab onto. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Look what Paul says about the Spirit of God in your life. 8, 26 and 27. Paul writes, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Through wordless groans, He also searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. Here Paul's saying that as you struggle with prayer, what to say, how to say it to God, God is telling you here through the Apostle Paul that the Spirit is going to help with those prayers. Again, it says, we do not know what we ought to pray for, verse 26, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. I don't know fully what that means, but here's what I do know. That when I'm struggling, when I'm praying at 5.30 in the morning, and I'm not sure what to say, or I feel like I'm saying the same things again, or, and I just don't feel comfortable with how much I'm praying or, or what I'm saying, God says, that's all right. My spirit is there, and taking your words that you don't even know fully that you're saying, or understand, and through His Spirit, is taking those words and wordless groans up to the Father, and taking everything you need said to the Father, even though you're struggling to get it out. The Spirit takes everything you need to say to the Father, even though you're struggling to get it out. I don't know how all that works. I can't break that down with a flow chart. I can't break it down scientifically, but I can break it down by faith. My Heavenly Father told me that the Spirit works this way in my life, and I am blessed by it. And that's all I need to know. God's presence is within me in the Spirit. I have a guarantee of salvation in the future. I have help in my prayers. That's all I need to know right now in this life. My God is with me. And then finally, He affects your personal growth. Let's just pick the last one, Titus 3, and we're done. We started with this in our announcements. We'll talk a little bit more about this next week. But the Spirit of God is not just hanging around in your life. He's not just sitting around watching what you're doing. The Spirit of God lives within you to invoke change. Because God's never going to be content with you just being the same old person you've always been. Titus 3, verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, that's baptism, and what? The renewal of the Holy Spirit who He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Spirit lives within you not only to assure you of God's presence and assure you of the future and to help you with prayer. The Holy Spirit lives within you to make sure you're not the same person tomorrow that you are today. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians about grieving the Holy Spirit through sin. The Holy Spirit's not going to just allow you to do the same old things you did back before you were a believer. 
The Holy Spirit's not going to just accept you as you are because everybody else accepts you that way. The Holy Spirit's going to go to work on bad habits. The Holy Spirit's going to work on sinful attitudes. If you're a gossip, the Holy Spirit says, we're going to go to work on that because I will not tolerate that in my people. If lust is consuming you, the Holy Spirit's going to say, I'll never let you live one day comfortably with lust. If you're someone who lives by deceit, that is big stories, or lying to get out of a jam, the Holy Spirit's going to say, no way is that going to be tolerated. And you'll never feel good about lying as a believer because the Holy Spirit's presence is in your life. If you think money's going to make you happy, the Holy Spirit's going to make sure that those things never make you happy. You might have a lot of stuff, but you'll never have peace. That's the Holy Spirit at work. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you to keep you uncomfortable with the things that do not have anything to do with God and to make you comfortable with the things that do have to do with God. Prayer, assurance of salvation, change of life. And that's why Paul said, do not be filled with alcohol, but said, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The most redeeming songs we will sing are the songs we will sing just now. Songs that speak of greater things, eternal things. Next week, we'll look a little closer at what we've previewed today. But understand, if you're a believer, you have the Spirit of God. He comes at the point of baptism. And He lives within you so that you're never the same. And that you're richly blessed. By faith that God is with you, even in your darkest moments and your most alone hours. And that God has never left you or forsaken you or forsaken you in any way. He is always there through His Spirit. We're now sing a song to encourage us to increase our faith, to be stronger in what God has told us, because everything is by faith in this life, based on the evidence that God has given for His existence. Leave here a changed person. But if you know you need to change, there's all kinds of avenues that Scripture points to take. One, be convicted of sin, that, hey, I've got to get out of the sinning business, or be convicted that Jesus is the Son of God and I need to put my faith in Him and not in other people or myself. Repenting, changing, confessing Him as Lord. There are different steps people need to take, but it culminates in baptism, one being forgiven of their sins through being baptized and raised to walk in newness of life. That's when the Spirit comes in and says, I will be with you forever as you stay with me. Let that be your life.